Good evening and uh, welcome to tonight's Shia. First of all, I'd like to wish a Mazel Tov to Mr. and Mrs. Pinchas Rabin of Edgware, who sponsored the Shia tonight in honor of the engagement of their youngest son, Shaoli, Shaol, Rav uh, Shaol, to Miss Etty Halprin of Monsi. And lots of nachas and good health. Uh, I'd like to also before and that, uh, although many times Mr. and Mrs. Rabin have been sponsors of the Shear, there is room for sponsorship for other people also. Anyone wants to, to do so, you're welcome to do so and be in touch in the future. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity also to share with you a personal simcha, which is just now one month since we made chasana, and we, at the chasana, gave out this, for this sefer, Nasivim B'Halocho Aminheg. Uh, it's a collection of about 70 uh, halacha articles which have written over the last 40 years, since uh, I was in Kailo, and uh, some of them are quite recent, and a couple of other very beautiful um, addenda. There's something about Agadita, but there's a couple of other historical value uh, in your name. And uh, anyone who's listening wants to get hold of a copy, uh, you can be in touch and I'll try to get one your way. Now, let's go now to the first question on our Shia tonight. <clears throat> and that is, someone's asking me about the word the Kudsha in Kaddish and as you can see you've got here eight copies of different parts of the annotated Siddha which is published it's now about tw almost 20 years since it was published by Kahas and it's inconsistent that you see the first one it says the Kudsha with uh with outer star without the asterisk this one and the third one does have, the fourth one does have, the fifth one does, the sixth doesn't, seventh does, and the eighth does. It's inconsistent whether there is the asterisk or not, just to fill you in, that the asterisk is there to tell you whether the shvo is a resting shvo, an inaudible shvo, shvo nach, or is it an audible shvo, shvo no, a moving shvo. And the asterisk was introduced by the printer in Vilna uh, back in Tofresh Ein Aleph as a symbol to tell us that this Shvo is a Shvo no. So the, the inconsistency is in what it is. But what is the question is what is correct? Is it Shmei de Kud Sho Brichu or Shmei de Kud Sho? Is the shavu of the dalit? Is a dalit with a shavu? Is is it brought out or is it a silent shavu? That is his, his question. Okay, so now let's uh, go back to. So what you have on the second screen is from the Vilna print, which I mentioned just now, of Vilna Tofresh Ein Aleph. And that's from which the Siddha Tila Sashem was reprinted back in Top Shin Vov, approximately. So it was a, it's a, photoc a photocopy of, of this Siddha. And as you can see here, the word Dekudsha is actually not with a Vov Malupum, but rather with a Kubutz or three dots. And to explain a, a rule here, and that is we've got the vowels are in five there's five there's five groups well there's five and five vowels uh five are tenuous gedolois and five are tenuous katanois so that komats is a tenua gedola a more stressed one and its parallel counterpart tenua katana is a patoch seire is the tenua gedola the more stressed one and the segoil is the counterpart, the Tshnuah Ketano. Then we've got um, 
we've got a cholom, and then we've got what's called a comet's cotton, which would mean when a cholom, like the word coil, so that's a that's a cholom. Now sometimes the word coil is connected to another word with what we call a makap with a hyphen. So kol davar. So at that point the coil is reduced to a comet. Now we with the Sephardim tend to pronounce the regular comets as a as we pronounce a patach, but the uh, the comets cotton, which is a diminished cholo, they pronounce it also as a comets. So they would say kol davar because the comets in or the word davar do, dovor or davar is a comets what we call the comets godel, and that is diminished to a patoch in pata in pronounce Sephardi pronunciation, whereas koil reduced to kol does not come down to kal. So that that the comet's cotton. So for Ashkenazim, we don't have much of a difference between comet's cotton, comet's godel. You look in Svardish Sidurim, they do have um, let's say in the Imre Fi Sidur, I've noticed uh, they will have the comet's cotton, will have the the vertical part longer as a way of indicating that this is a comet's cotton, which should therefore be, should be pronounced as comet's cotton. We have Chirik. There's two ways of a chirik, e and e. So the tenuah gedola is the e, and the tenuah ktano is the e. And finally, what's relevant to us is the the u and u. Let's say in the word bull, it's also that would be a, a kibbutz. It's a shortened um, u sound. And then in the word room, which is a more stressed u sound. That's one's a comet's godel, sorry, one's a shuruk, one's a tenuah gedola, one's a tenuah ketano. Before coming back to our discussion, I just want to point out something fascinating, which Rav Broin of Crown Heights pointed out to me a good few years ago. But in the word komats, we have the vowels of the name komats. I've got a komats and a patoch. In the word patoch, we've got a patoch and then a komats. So you've got, in both of the names, they've got their primary nikud and then they have the second consonant will be of their of their counterpart so too in seire seire so it's the a and and the air and i guess according to that it should be segel but never mind and then we've got the coil the oi o because as i said the coil will be reduced to a comet's cotton that will be the coil um rik so here we have the e and the e sound and Ku, ku, boots. Yeah, so this is the, the first one is the shorter one. And then we've got the longer one, the str more stressed one. That's the, the, the three dots in the diagonal. And then we've got the vov with the dot. So then the primary one is the u, the stronger one. And the counterpart is the shorter one, which is the three diagonal dots. So that's in the names of, you see here, the kubots and shuruk, that they are, they've got both nikudim, but uh, in the opposite order, because one is the main one and one is the counterpart. Let's come back. So now we have here a rule that after a tnua gedola, so then a, a shvo following a tnua gedola will be a com will be a uh, shvo no. A shvo after a tnua ktano will be a shvo nach. That's that's the that's the rule here. So now, coming to our question, the word the could show. If you if you uh, vowelize the kum, the kuf with a sh with a kubutz, which is a tnuah ktano, there's no question that the shvo is a is a shvonach, and therefore it's the could show, not the could show. So coming back into the prints where they do have vovs, well, that may be just. For whatever reason, sometimes the card is printed without Nakudas. So sometimes the Vov is a bin coin of the the uh, three diagonal dots, kubots. And that's what it seems to be, therefore, the more correct one. That it's that it should be a um it should be a shvonach, and the asterisks which were put there really don't belong there. Uh well, I, I'm, as I'm going through this, 
some we came to also discussion uvene yerushalayim mira so uh, in the in the uh, regular chabad tilas hashem sira at least the american one there's going to be uvene yisro binyan oilam in in meshuvan esra the vase of uvene has got an asterisk you open to benching uvene yerushalayim mira the same vase does not have an asterisk. And you ask, um, where's consistency? So the secret is, this is just uh, not halacha, just those facts, that when it came to publishing the Tilas Hashem Siddha, I say largely they copied from the Seder uh, Ha'avoida printed in Vilna Tafreshainov. Certain parts where there was so much correction needed to the Vilna print, that instead they took it from the Torah or Siddha. When it came to benching, there was so much stuff which needed to be changed for whatever reason, that the Tila Sashem Siddha, the, uh, that, that, that fourth Tila Sashem Asha Sholem, benching is from the Torah or Siddha, not from the Seda Avodah Vilna Siddha. Consequently, in the Torah or Siddha, there are no asterisks. The asterisk were in Sechadosh, by the printer Vilna and Tafre Shain Aleph, whereas the Torah Siddha never had asterisks, as the Altarebbe never had asterisks in his, his Siddha. So Uvnei Yerushalayim in Benching doesn't have an asterisk because it's copied from the Torah Ur Siddha. And if you doubt my my uh, my, my uh, asser, uh, allegation or assertion, Simon Godel Yesbedova, that the Tila Sashem Siddha, following the Vilna Teh Siddha Avoida, has invariably the Hashem's name is Yud Yud. The Torah Oyer invariably is Yud Kei Vav Kei. Look, now take your Torah, your, your Til Sashem Siddha, open up to benching, and you see there, it's not Yud Yud, it's Yud Kei Vav Kei. And the answer is because that's been copied from the Torah Oyer Siddha, and therefore it's Yud Kei Vav Kei. Whereas the Shemun is largely copied from the uh, Seder Avoida Siddha, and therefore it's Yud Yud. Um, just a little bit of history. Okay. Um, now, since we're on on to Dikduk. So I'm going to what was called a Gilgal Shua, going on to another Dikduk thing, which again came this week. Yeah? So one of the teachers in school was we have a Chabad teacher and there's a non Chabad teacher, and challenging about the way you pronounce words in Shema. We're talking about young girls who are learning to Daven. So is it Uvlechtacho or Uvlechtacho? Is it over shachbacha, or was it uk shartom? So this is the question. So now, so the background to this is now these are what you have on the screen are both chabad sidurim. I don't know whether I've once discussed this before, but what happened is the following: there was a master didactic by the name of Reb Zalman Hena, a contemporary of the Baal Shem Tev, and he introduced various significant chidushim in the laws of Diktuk. He is not um, the last word, and there are others who vehemently disagree with him, most notably Rabbi Yaakov Emden, and he wrote a whole safer of arguing, but yeah, nevertheless, uh, Rabbi Salman Hena was definitely a great master in Diktuk. He's quoted uh, in in great reverence by the Prima Godim and others. And the Alter Rebbe seems to have also how do you say in English, Gerechen Sachmitem? He took him, he, res he respected his opinion. I'm not saying he gave him a, a blank check, but he certainly, we see that the Alter Rebbe, like I mentioned perhaps before, Terem called Yitzur Nivro rather than Yitzir Nivro. That vowel of Yitzur Nivro is a chidush of Reb Zalman Hena, and that's in our Siddur. The Alter Rebbe accepted it. Okay. So now, Reb Zalman Hena was of the opinion that the that these shvoin are shvoin noin and the printer of Vilna Tofresh Aleph followed the policies of Reb Zalman Han. And for many, many years, the Kohosida Tila Sashem was just a reprint and another reprint and another reprint. And back in the Tofshin Mems, Reboruch Noe writes to the Rebbe about an issue with the Shavoin. And the Rebbe says, I don't have 
I don't have the person, as far as I remember, I don't have, we have bigger problems than that in the diktuk of a sinner, and I don't have the right person to do it, and that's why it stays the way it is. Something on those lines. The letter is published, I think, in, in, in Sadiq Lamelech. So anyway, around 20 years ago, it was the, the, um, the publishers of the Kahos in Eretz Yisrael came to the point where they felt they need to retype set the Siddur. So instead of just re copying, 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 kind of retypes it from scratch. And Reb, uh, the head of Kahos in Eretz Yisrael, Reb Mendel, Manat, many, uh, many um, wolf, is a son-in-law of the late, I mean, it's like yours, a son-in-law of the late Reb Motel Schusterman. And Reb Motel Schusterman was at the behest of the Rebbe, taught Dikduk in 770. He was a Balkhoyre by the Rebbe. He was very knowledgeable in Dikduk. And somehow, <clears throat> many wolf decided <clears throat> not to be beholden to Reb Zalman Hena, and instead we're going to make the Nuka Hasida is going to be according to the rules as we're taught by Reb Motel Schusterman, which follows a policy not like Reb Zalman Hena. And therefore, if you start comparing Israeli Sidurim to American Sidurim, you're going to see a lot of differences if you are sensitive to Shvoyen. And I'm, I'm, I'll tell you, my, my confess that I use a Torah Ursida, which doesn't have any asterisks at all, because I find to get, you know, in the middle of davening to have to start. Yeah, he's right or he's wrong. Leave me alone. I just want to daven. So I, 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 I just use a Siddur without any asterisk. But fine. But this, this is what's happened over here. So the lower screen, the lower uh, uh, picture is from the Israeli Siddur. And there it's Uv Lech Recho, Uv Komecho. Whereas, and that's why they are scroll also. And, and that seems to be the official position, the literature position of pronouncing Uv Komecho, Uch Sabto. However, the, as they say, the Reb Zalman Hena taught, and this is the way it's in the original Tel um, Hashem Siddur, whatever, Tel Hashem Asholim, that it is a shvo no. And just in case that's not so clear, I put it also on the screen the transliteration, which appears in the Tilas Hashem Siddha, and it's um and you can see here uh Vershinantum Verdibarto, where is it? Uv U Velechtacho. Yeah, you see that that U and then a hyphen Velechtacho U hyphen vishach becho and so on rather than uv hyphen kumecho etc so that's that's the policy which has been followed i also took the trouble to listen to a recording of remotel schusterman uh as he's reading pashas was kind of reading pashas shema and again you can hear it's overhaul over shock etc so definitely that's the way our messiah is to pronounce it as a shvo no and I spoke today to someone in Eretz Yisrael who has a great gishmak in Dikduk, and he corroborated that this is the view of Reb Zalman Hanna. And here's an interesting point: if it were, if it were a shvonach, then it should be, let's see, of the word, um, then it should be uch tavtom. It should be after a shvonach, then the tof, it should be, it should be a tof rather than a sof. If, if it's overchol, if, if it's uv, it should be overchol. The fact that it is chol and, um, and it's sabtom tells you that this is a shvono. Um, and all right, so that, that's enough of dictic for this evening. Um, now let's go on to a question about Hilchus Shabbos. Okay. So the bottom line is, I'm happy the way I was taught, overlechtecho, overkomecho, etc. And although not everyone agrees, um, art scroll included don't agree on that. They follow the Litvish way, but that's, this seems to be the Messiah, uh, which I was brought up with. Okay. Okay. Let's go on to a new point. Totally new question. So someone, two, somewhere in in, in Central Europe. Last Shabbos, or was it two Shabbos ago? There was a debate. You got a, we've got a, a Shabbos belt, and that's where you can have a key added to your Shabbos belt. Yeah, 
and well, that's what the Shabbos God is for, to be able to, are you allowed to um, link in the keys into your Shabbos belt on Shabbos, or does that have to be done before Shabbos? That was the question. And the fellow who contacted me says, why should there be a problem of in, in, in incorporating the key on Shabbos? If we are talking about Makkah Bepatish, you're completing the belt. Well, the belt was a complete belt before, so you're not fixing the belt. If you're going to be talking about tying, who says, well, who says you have to make a Kesha Shakayoma? You can make a uh you can make a loop, whatever. So he's asking, is there any problem of, of, of clipping those keys into position on Shabbos? And there was something in my mind which bothered me because I remembered something that Alter Rebbe saying it has to be done before Shabbos. Although he doesn't spell it out so clearly, but we're going to that's what we're going to be looking at. Now, so the main focus here is in Simon Shin Aleph, which is talking about carrying on Shabbos. And on the uh, on the in the Shukhan the new the new edition, Rebero Levin, Zalzan Gizunt, refers to his to an article which he had written in Ha'ora Sabiurim, where he'd explored this very question. And I read through the article. Um, I'm not going to say I absorbed everything, lots of uh, interesting stuff there. It is valuable to know that this whole business of taking a key and making it part of a belt, where in, in, in several Rishonim were quite against it. I believe Marami Rutenberg is one of those, but it's, it was not unanimous. Now let's read the Lauter Rebbe's Loshen about the key. He says, that earlier we were talking about if you have a key which was made into a brooch. You took a key and you coated it with silver. Now then you've got an interesting, it's got a double identity. Is it a, is it an ornament or is it a tool to open a door? So that's a debate when you've got something that's a, it's a dual identity. Can you say, oh, it's a brooch? Or do you say, no, it's a key? That's a, that's an earlier discussion. Following off of that discussion comes the, this, this thing. Im hu kavua hagura. If it is fixed at the end of a belt. Ve'osri ke'ein zenku. Now, I'm going to tell you that the brackets, which are with the yellow background, were put in by myself. In the Shulchan Aruch, if you open it up, there are those those brackets out there, and I'm going to explain to you why I put them there. But meanwhile, let's just read the halach. The osuke ein zenkel. If the key is at the end of a belt, and it's made like a buckle, possibly la gerbay. So now the key is now being used to clasp the belt. Yesh matirim. There are those who permit this. Because then it's an accessory to the belt. And therefore it is, whatever the word bottle is, but it becomes like nullified towards, it becomes part of the belt. Then there's the added explanation. Even though it's not only, only for the Shabbos. Let's just read those words. As I said, not all Ashkenazim agreed with this. But the Maril was one of those who said it is okay. And, that, and that's been accepted. Okay, there are more follows this. The mix as Medinus Elo, that there's a concession that a key made as part of a belt, in as a part of a buckle of a belt, is okay. All right, let's let's now go back. Why did I put in those brackets? I want to explain. What are brackets in the Alter Rebbe's Shukhan Aruch? It's well known that the Alter Rebbe had sometimes chidush edinim, and he put them in brackets because he wanted to perhaps come back later and review them. That, that's the common explanation of the brackets. Not all brackets are the same, but one rule I have with brackets in the Alter Rebbe is that the sentence has to be readable with the bracket or without the bracket. You should be able to read the sentence smoothly without the bracket, and then you can reread the sentence with the bracket. So now, let's try to read the, set, the sentence without, you know, um, without the bracket. 
אם הוא קבוע ברשת חגורה ועוסרי, וכן נוהג במקסס מדינה סיילו. That does not make sense at all. That, that, that sentence does not make sense. Whereas, if you read it, if it's ברשת חגורה, and it's made, and the Ke'en Zenkel can be sometimes a translation, okay, it's made to, as a belt. יש מתירים לפי שעוזו משמש לחגורו או בוטל אצלו. Then the Alter Rebbe adds, you know what, this belt, buckle uh, solution, is even if it's only for the, for the one Shabbos, it's also good. So that's a, a Chidush Din, and he put it in brackets. I'm pretty convinced that that's the way the brackets should be, rather than the way it's uh, appeared in the print. Okay. Be that as it may. So now we have a Chidush Din, which Maril and others accepted that if a key is made into part of a buckle, that is a hetter, to, to, to wear the belt on Shabbos with the key. Simon, further on, the same simon, we look at Sif Chav Gimel, talks about a handkerchief. And you know, the younger generation, if you want to see a handkerchief, you have to go into an antique shop. You might find a, hand, a cloth handkerchief. Anyway, some people used to have a handkerchief in their pockets, on Shabbos, he wants to have a handkerchief, can't carry. So he says, You're going to tie it, similar solution, to the end of the belt. A permanent knot. Oh, of course it has to be, if it's a permanent knot, it has to be before Shabbos. So here, by the, by the uh, handkerchief, it has to be a kesha shel kayoma. And here, with the key, it seems to be it's okay for the just for the Shabbos. Okay. Let's now go to something. Now, um, I put on the questions something which I may have passed and wrong before, but I'm pretty sure that it's wrong. I have a pair of reading glasses, and I want to take them to show. Can I take the reading glasses? And I have an elastic band, and I'll put the elastic band around in way, you know, the handles on either side, and then I wrap, I wrap it around my waist. And uh, there, I got my, I got my, I got my glasses to show, and come to show, and I'll take them off the elastic, etc. Is that okay? Is that any different to using a key to hold an elastic around your waist? And here you're using a pair of glasses. Seems to be fairly innocuous, yeah. And I've already um, bavoran that we're not going to get away so easily with this one. And this is where a Ribero Levin points this out. Later on, I'm oh, sorry, earlier on in this simon, and those who are doing three Prokhim a day of Rambam will recognize this from yesterday's Shia Rambam, about a needle. Having a needle in your lapel uh, and walking out in the street on Shabbos. Now, there's a massive Chiddush here in the Alter Rebbe, and I apologize that I haven't managed to check where the other poskim uh, follow this, but it's a massive Chiddush. Because when you read a Mishnah, you're talking about a needle which is just being kept for storage. It's a convenient place under your lapel. That's called carrying a needle. But let's read what the Alter Rebbe says over here. A man who's going out with a needle which has got an eye. The needle is being used here to connect the two sides of your coat. You've got a jacket, you've got a halat, and it's got two sides, and you want to connect them with one another instead of a button. So you put them over one another, and you put in a needle to hold it together. If it's somewhere where it's normal to do so in the weekday, if you're taking a needle and you're using it as a form of button, and he says it's considered a navayra mina toyra, the fish ain't derech litchev shom machat anakuba. It would be normal to use a pin. Which has got a solid head, not an e a needle, which has got an eye. 
now that you are improvising. And instead of using a pin to hold your coat together, you're using a needle to do exactly the same thing. You're using that pin, that that needle to hold your coat together, and it's considered carrying. And here's very powerful lotion. You've got something you want to transport from A to B. And you're going to use it as to hold, hold your coat together. But it's neither tachshit nor derech malbush. It's not an ornament. It's not derech malbush. And therefore it's considered carry. So now I ask you, reading those words, you cannot carry stuff, sorry, go out with stuff if it's not a tachshit nor a derech malbush. A pair of glasses with a rubber band, with a rubber, with a rubber elastic around your waist. I, 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 I'm, I, am, I have no choice to say it's us. The Raisa, the Rabbonon, you can say it's, it's in the bracket says that's called Hitzor Kedarko. You can say it's not Kedarko, it's an Isa the Rabbonon. But there's a definitely no. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very convinced of this. So this is where Beryl Levin asks the question. If so, if a machat, which is a needle, which is holding your coat together, is considered carrying, so why is a need, why is a key holding your belt together? Why is that not called carrying? Which we have to explore. Of course, it's mutter, but we have to explore why. Um. Rabbi Shlomo Zalman in Shemir Shabbos Hilchoso has this note, a, 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 a similar type of horror. There is also yesterday's Rambam, Poirefes, as a word in Hebrew, Prifo Alo Ego is Prifo Alo Even. I don't know whether there's a word in English for it, but imagine I want to hold my coat together, the two sides of my coat, and I don't have any buttons. So I take a small ball shaped item and a, a stone or an, a nut and I gather the material around it and now there's a bulge and then around the bulge I take a string and tie it around a few times and that holds it together that's that that activity is called perifo and it says you are allowed to do so with a with a stone even with a nut but then we have the following halacha. It's a shin gimel. The Alter Rebbe doesn't have this. It's missing the Alter Rebbe Shukhan Aruch, unfortunately. A woman wants to carry a nut from A to B to give her son a nut. She's not using the nut to hold a coat together. She's using the coat to take the nut from A to B. It's not permitted. Carmelis, it's Isa the Rabbonon, and therefore to a Kirshus Adam is not allowed. To a Carmelis, it's allowed because it's Shavuz this Shavuz. Says the Mishnah Brewer there, Osur, to transport the nut by wrapping it around with a string, with the Rabbonon lasses came. Avshu derech malbush, vein derech itzobekach. Nation nira kemaremes lohoitzi beshabes. You're doing shtick. You're doing shtick to carry a nut from A to B. So now we're back to the question. Why is a key any different to the nut? Why is the key any different to the to the macht? This is this is the the the, uh, the, the question. So the teretz is the teretz is that the 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 story. Well, let's go with the, the with the handkerchief. It's become part of the chagurah bekesha shel kayomo. That's why it's allowed. It's become one thing with the belt. So coming back to the to the to the key, imu kavua b'roisha chaguro. It's become kavua. It became, it was fixed before Shabbos. It was fixed into the chaguro. Now I the Alter Rebbe doesn't say le Shabbos. It says be Shabbos. The word is I think very simple. Imagine taking today, I'm not saying on Shabbos, taking your buckle. Opening it up, taking out the tongue, and then putting a key back in place and putting the tongue back on, putting a key instead of the tongue. 
To do that on Shabbos. Hayal el adas, to be mad such a thing. That's mommy for talking Kaylee. So if, of course it can't be done on Shabbos. Chiddush is, that even though this improvisation of putting the key is, in, in, instead of the, the tongue of the buckle, is only done for the Shabbos and not Kesha Shukayomo, no, it's also good. Oh, it's also okay. But definitely, the Hetir is only because it's become part of the Chagura. Therefore, he ask, can I do so on Shabbos? Do so on Shabbos is the same as the Bachat. You've got, a, you've got a key, you want to bring it to B, you take a couple of clips or whatever, and you wrap it around your waist. You can give it. So that's the Mamish, the same thing as the Bachat. I don't see any hetha for it. Now, that's what I'm, I'm this is my, you know, uh, I'll tell you. Shmir Shabbos Gilchoso says you are allowed. He's allowed, he says you are allowed to make a, you can, you can, you can read it here, this is Peyot Ches, Peyot Sif Memtes, and he gives us a guidance how to do it. And I'm just, if I can go to the next slide. No, it's not here, is it? Oh, he refers to Reb Dobit Feldman's, Rav Feldman's Kitzel Shekhanar. And he talks here about taking a key and putting a string through. Yeah, you a, a, a string through. And one, the, the middle of the string is through the hole at the top of the key. And the other end goes round your waist. And then you do a loop at the end of the key. So there's Shemir, Shemir Shabbos is referring to this. And he says, you're allowed to do so on Shabbos. Yeah? So this is where he says, you have a, take a long string and you put it through the hole, uh, the upper hole of the ring. And then you tie the other two ends, on, on Shabbos. So he seems to be allowing, allowing you to do so, uh, to do this whole thing on Shabbos, although it's not explicit, but it's fairly fairly evident. And they, also the Pisket Shabbos, Say, seems to say that you're allowed to do this on Shabbos so long as it's not a Kesha Shakayam. Um, I'm totally unconvinced because I think the Heter is only because Mamish it's become part of the belt from before Shabbos. In Rabbi um, Beryl Levin's article, he challenges also he's talking about Kavua the Kavua Baresha Chaguru. It's fixed into the belt. And what you're talking about, you're taking some clips. A clip a here, a, clip, a little a, a press, a, it's in, it's out. That's called kavua. He questions whether you can use the term kavua with the use of clips. Um, since I'm already onto this uh, topic, a couple of points, a couple more points. In if you go to Crown Heights in the hardware store and get a key made, very likely they'll make a key. They'll give you a key which has got two holes besides the main hole. And it was it was said that this was the Rebbe's Minhig to have the two additional holes so that the somehow the, the key, the top of the head of the key should be more significant in holding it together. I've been told by um, families of the Rebbe's Gaboyim, one of them, that that's not true. That the Rebbe's key did not have two holes. What else I say? Now, one last thing. Yours truly was of the feeling that it's, it, since the Heter here is not unanimous, he says, yes, Matirin, yeah? Yes, Matirin, to use it as a buckle. How about putting the key mamish in the middle of the belt? Not as a buckle. It's tied by even Kavua, Makesha Shakayama. You have this key in the middle of the belt. And I, I was, I felt that then you avoided this question because uh, here it says, if like a buckle is not so, not so unanimous, but if it's mamish part of the belt, then it's better. Currently, my feeling is the opposite. That when it's here, at least you have a header that it's a functional part of a belt. It's, it's tougher to the belt. That's a shtickle header. But if it's going to be Stam and Lulu's Kiki in the middle of a belt, not, it's not a Derch Levisha, it's not a Derch Tachshit, so what's the Hatan? So I'm really backtracking on that. And um, I know I'm going to get some flack about this, but you know, Lutori heave a little bit on it, sorry. So I'm really very um, surprised 
with what I've discovered in um, what's going on here about the heter of using a key for um, uh, a Shabbos bell. Someone sent me just about 15 minutes ago a link to a website called The Key Belt. And it actually has, you can check it up yourself. Um, my yeshiva training didn't tell me how to put a video into a PowerPoint. So I don't know how to put it on um, the, the video to show you the video, but you can look it up, the key belt um, dot whatever. And it has actually Imam buckle, and it has a way of pulling out the, the tongue and putting in a key and putting it back in place and having the key mamish as, as a um, so instead of these little clips, it's mamish serving as a tongue of a buckle, mamish like the uh, heter of the maharil, and that, uh, that that you have a you know a, that, that's that's been a gush that's to be my makel, yeah. But less than that, uh, I'm 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 uneasy. Okay, let's move on. So we dealt with questions number three and number four together. And so now we're going to go on to question number five. Does a walk-in fridge, um, yeah, does a walk-in fridge freezer need to have a mezuzah? So the uh, general view is that many poskim have, uh, have said that since you cannot live in a fridge, certainly not in a freezer, therefore it's not a base dira, it doesn't need to have a mezuzah. And so then I looked up, you can see the references that you have on your sheet. There is a famous discussion about a small room opens up to a big room, a small walk-in closet. I'm not talking about a closet where you stand outside and you hang your coats. A walk-in closet, a larger kind of wardrobe, doesn't need to have a mezuzah. So you've got here, it's less than dal, dal, dal. You know, the shear for a mezuzah is a, is a building, a room which has got four by four armors. Comes along the Hamudi Doniel, who is quoted in the Pisgah Tshuva in Hichas Mezuzah. And he says, the she of Dal Dam is talking about a, a freestanding dwelling. You have a shed or whatever. A small hut, which is less than Dal Dal Dal, is not a Mezuzah. Because it's not livable. Not livable normal, in a normal way. But you have a big house, a normal sized house. And off it, there's a room, which is a wardrobe, a pantry, whatever. It's a room, it's part of the house. Is it part of a dwelling? Yes. So he says that's not exempt from mezuzah because it's part of a larger dwelling. It's and it's 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 a function of the dwelling. He says that, that's what you do. Is that's the Mechamud Daniel. Then we have Rabbi Kiva Eger in the same space uh, in the Shulchan Aruch, and he's, he has a different argument. He says, true, the small room does not require a mezuzah, but the door he called the word kemechi. They say in his German Yiddish small room. But the kemeche, the door of the kemeche is a door to the room. It's a door to the kemeche. It's a door to the, the little room. It's also a door to the big room. So you need to have a mezuzah because it's a door to the big room. So these are two arguments to oblige having a mezuzah on a smaller room, less than dal, 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 when it's part of a larger field. Now coming back now we're talking about the fridge, even the fridge. Now you nothing to do with the, how big the fridge is. What are you telling me? The fridge is unlivable, but it's part of a building, a part of a house, it's part of a, a moisture. The, the building is a livable building, it's a function of that building. So the fact that you can't spend a long time, you can't live in the fridge, is the same thing as, as, as the pantry, which is less than dal dal dal, but it's a part of the function of the house. So it's chayv bimazuz. Then we take Rebbe Kiva Eger's approach. And he says, well, it's a door to the fridge, but it's also a door to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the kitchen, whatever. It's a door to the larger room. So bottom line is that despite in, you, it's, you cannot live inside a fridge, certainly not in a freezer uh, for a prolonged period, but there are arguments that you should put up a mezuzah. And so this seems to be the later consensus that you should put up a mezuzah Without a brocha, because it's not 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 unanimous. Okay, um, one last point about that was, although normally the mezuzah is put inside the door frame, if the door frame is inside the fridge or the freezer, I don't know whether the 
cold temperature would cause damage to the mezuzah over a longer period. I don't know. I don't know how what they how how they how mezuzahs cope with extreme weather. And because of that, I advise them to put the mezuzah on the outside rather than in the inside of the fridge. We have one last um, point which I wanted to share with you. Also, is someone someone sent me this is somewhere in Midwest America. But it's the same toy everywhere. And that is the following. We have here, it's not a very clear picture. We have here uh, sliding doors. And these are to the outside. So what you see here seems to be a, um, these, this wood, these wooden pieces seem to be uh, like an overhang sticking out beyond the house. It, but it's, it's, it's doors to the outside. Now we have a rule of Hekertzir. We have a rule that that the door, the way the door swings, that's going to dictate where the, what's the inside and what's the outside. And we have a general rule about that. What about a sliding door, which doesn't swing in, doesn't swing out? So here we have Rabbi Yaakov Emden came along with a chiddush, which I think is fairly logical, that you have a door between, let's say, the dining room and the kitchen. There's a doorway and there's a sliding door. And he says, where is the track where the door is sliding? Does the door slide on the dining room side? Or does it the door on, on the on the on the kitchen side? So let's clarify. The doorway is 90 centimeters wide. The door is a meter wide, 900 centimeters wide. So the door is either sliding on the one side of the wall or the other side of the wall. So the side where the track is, where the door is sliding, he says that's the heck it's here. Just like the tier, the hinge is where the hinge is if it's on the interior, that's considered the interior. So the same thing if the track where the door travels. When the door slides, that's the interior. Okay, that's Rabbi Kiva Ege. Oh, sorry, Rabbi Yaakov Emden. Now we have, however, how we have the, the following. Here we have two doors. We've got two doors next to one another. One of these doors is rigid. It doesn't slide. The other one does slide. So now you got to take the Rebbe Kiva, Rebbe Yaakov Emden's Svor and say, oh, if the, which side is the sliding one? The inside one or the outside one? And that's going to dictate which side you're going to put the mezuzah, the right side, which side is the right side. Just to make things more complicated, in the same room, there's two sets of doors. And one, the, the uh, carpenter, when he put in the door, he put the rigid one on the outer side and the moving one on the inside. And the other one, it's the, the opposite, that the inner one is the rigid one and the outer one is the sliding one. Are you going to tell me that, the, that that's going to make a difference where, where it's called derech halicho, one way or the other? I find it very difficult to take Rabbi Yankiv Emden's chiddush so far and to say, that to, to apply it in such a case. Find it not, not not very convincing. Generally, sometimes I'll tell you to put up a mezuzah on the right as you go to the garden. There is such a thing, but in principle, mezuzahs are more for houses than for gardens, and therefore, I'm more inclined to say put the mezuzah on the right as you enter from the open air to the house. That seems to be more correct rather than making a whole pilpul, which is Heketzir, based upon Rabbi Yankiv Emdin, etc., with the Chiddush Chabad will follow Heketzir. I'm not so confident, confident with all of that in this case, and I'd prefer to say, put the mezuzah on the right as you come in from the outside. Now, if you're looking at this picture carefully, you can see where I'm pointing now. That's where, that's the, um, that's part of the rigid panel. And the mezuzah has to be on that that edge of the rigid panel, not at the far end, and uh, at the far left, should we say, or the far right, which are when you're coming from the outside, because as far as I'm concerned, the rigid panel is a wall. And you can't walk through walls. A Pesach is where you walk through. So the where the door is opening and allowing you to walk through, that's called Pesach. Where the wall, where the door is not allowing you to go through, that is going to be called 
wall and therefore the mezuzah has to be at the edge of the walkthrough area and therefore it's going to be on the edge of the rigid panel uh, where it abuts the the open space where you can walk through i'm going to stop here because i want to get into into shul in time for my at 9 30. i mean while i wish you a wonderful shabbos i want you to hear basuras tovis from achenu bnei israel be'eretz akodesh especially the shvuyim be'eretz azo and um be'ike be'ulo and mashiach said keno b'mheiru yamein amamish chadchilari amen yashikoyach Out.